Ahoy, you salty sailors. Time to raise anchor and set sail for your best scrawny life. Arr. All right, there's the pike fly we're working with. An articulated pattern. I've got the trusty old seven weight. That's uh, the first rod I ever built from a kit. I am six seven weight. Been broken and repaired several times. We're in the town of Alden today on the Iowa River. Uh, the reason why is because about several miles downstream is the town of Iowa Falls, where there's a large impoundment, which would have given the fish uh, some deep water refuge during last summer's drought. So hopefully in this section between Alden and Iowa Falls, the population has not been as impacted by the drought. Just had a little pike come up here and he missed it. He was right, right alongside the bridge. So I, I'm definitely getting getting better, but but I don't think I'm quite ready for a full day of paddling yet. So I came up here on foot. Oh, there he was. There he was. Real small one. I'm gonna switch out the fly to a smaller fly. Oh, 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 there he is. There he is. All right, little fella. Oh, calm down. There we go. Not a biggie, but it's an encouraging sign. Just that he's that he's there at all. You know, these fish are somewhat sensitive when it comes to droughts and hot weather and long summers. There's a better pike. Oh, popped off. That was a decent sized one. And I tried and tried to, to get that fish to strike again, but he never did. There's always that big one that gets away. Looks like he's foul hooked. Oh, he is. Well, oh, there's another little pug, anyway. Well, I foul hooked it. I did manage to land about a 15 inch smallmouth, but somehow my camera was not running when I caught it. But there's a photograph I snapped with the phone. Again, an encouraging sign to have that fish in the river.
There's another small mouth. Little fella. Huh. <laughs> it's not even hooked. The hook caught him around the fin. I mean, the, the, the leader went through his mouth. Hook caught him around the fin. They're striking short today or something. Whoop, there he goes. Just heard an osprey somewhere. I haven't seen it yet. Where are you? Oh, there he is. He's, he's got something too. He's got a fish. Nice. Look at this box elder. All burled up. And they've got some. Got some uh, jelly fungus maybe coming out of that burl. Yeah, there. That's. Uh, Auricularia. Whole trunk is all burled up. That'll have some of that red color in it. Although it's not a it's not a fungal type of spalting, so it does fade. But yeah, if you cut into that you'd probably see some of that red color. The red segment in the handle of this fishing rod is what I'm talking about. That is a pigment produced by the tree in response to stress. The black line is a uh, fungal zone line spalting, but the red is produced by the tree. Switched over to the micro gadget here to uh, work the bottom a little bit more. See if we can get a walleye out of this run. You can tell, see how the surface is broken down there? You can tell it's solid limestone. It's this broken limestone, just like this, all the way across the river. To the other side so they'll be hugging but you know there's not a major current breaking obstruction other than the rocks on the bottom so they'll be holding real tight to the to the bottom so we'll get down with the we've got the five foot sink tip on this rig and uh, we'll get down a little closer to the bottom with that And it stays, it's steadier. You know, the pike fly, it, it sinks pretty quick too, but I'm pumping it in a way so it rises and falls, you know, erratically. Whereas this is just going to kind of skim along the bottom. A better presentation for walleye. Well, I did not get a walleye out of that run, and I switched back to the pike gear. The problem with this segment of river is that there's so many good areas the normal rules um, don't necessarily apply uh, you know typically you'd look for walleyes to accumulate um, you know moving upstream to to become concentrated in the first few miles below the dam but uh, there's a lot of great areas in this segment of river and they could be in any one of those since they're coming up from the Iowa Falls impoundment uh, one of the best places is the first riffle right above that impoundment, you know, a really nice, cleanly swept um, glacial gravel type of riffle. So uh, in all likelihood, they're, they're spending the day in the impoundment and then running up to that riffle to spawn. So. All right, we got another hammer handle here. Another snot rocket. Whoa, easy 
there. Pretty fish. Really marked up. Really marked up nice. Swallowed that fly. Here's a look at the Iowa Falls impoundment. We have had some rain and the river level has risen, but it's still low actually for this time of year. But I mean, every, every little bit of rain will help. But there are some fish moving up the river and overall, it's an encouraging sign that the, this segment of river anyways has not been completely uh, impacted by the drought. Now the other river segments, uh, yeah, who knows, I mean, it, uh, some of the longer segments, uh, I, you know, I'm pretty sure we probably lost some fish. But anyway, this large impoundment is what ensures that this segment of river anyway uh, continues to have some good fishing. And it dropped down, I mean the level dropped down it wasn't quite down to a trickle, and it didn't stop like some of the other rivers did, but but uh, it did drop down very, very low last summer. Very concerning. And I did see some suckers and so forth in the river, so I think the, the base of the food web is also intact. A lot of stoneflies and so forth rising as well, so, so um, the lower end of the food chain seems to be doing well. It seems to be doing okay as well. A really cool town if you wanted to take a little in-state vacation. Iowa Falls would be a great place. It's early April, a little too early to have morels up yet, but I have found some lore shells, the Gyromitra brunea. You'll recall that the edibility of these mushrooms is questionable. I have eaten Gyromitra brunea and Gyromitra caroliniana without any ill effects. It's primarily the European species that contains the most Gyromitrin. Um, they're an ascomycete, so you'll notice that multi-lobed cap. They're a good tasting mushroom. They taste similar to morels. But uh, I'll leave you to do your own research on whether you want to eat those. Notice the a well-decayed log laying on the forest floor with a lot of ground contact. And then the mushroom is emerging not from the log, but from the ground. So that's, those are important factors as well. Uh, it does have a stem. There you can see the whitish stem kind of underneath there. And then the multi-lobed wrinkled cap. So that is Gyromitra brunea. Always a cool find whether you plan to eat them or not. So they're funky, they're weird. Now something that you uh, definitely don't want to confuse for any other mushroom. And notice how this one emerges from the well-decayed log. So when you're looking at those well-decayed logs, it uh, uh, this is one to pay attention to. Notice the brown spore print on the edge of the cap where the caps have been, where it has been overlapped by another cap. That brown spore print is a key identifying characteristic. Uh, and also this one does not have a visible ring on the stem, but you can see at the margin of the cap where the partial veil has torn away from the stem. There's still some remnants left there. So this is the deadly Gallarina, Gallarina marginata. Uh, definitely a mushroom that you want to avoid.